Welcome to the 24th annual Dice Conversation around Mobile Games of the Year. Everyone nominated for Mobile Game of the Year has beautiful games that they've created, and they help to push the boundaries of what we're able to do in mobile games. Let's meet the nominees. First up from Hala Vista, we have Star St. Germain. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? Awesome, awesome, awesome. You can give the folks at home a little bit of information about you and, and the work that you've been doing. Yeah, um, I'm Star. I'm the Chief Design Officer at Aconite Co. And we made Hollow Vista. Uh, we have from Legends of Runeterra, we have Jeff Jew. How are you doing, Jeff? Hey, pretty good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. Give the folks a little bit of information about you. I think the folks at home have been really excited for the game and they would love to hear more about the work that you've been doing. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so yeah, I'm Jeff Ju. I'm the executive producer on Legends of Runeterra. Um, and I'm just happy to be representative for our awesome game. Um, we are building a collectible card game set in the League of Legends universe. Uh, and it's just been a real joy to make. So thanks for having us. Thank you for being here. Uh, next up, we have from Little Orpheus, we have Dan Pinchbeck. How are you doing, Dan? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having us on. Good, good, good. Give the folks a little bit of info about the game. I think uh, everyone who has, hasn't had a chance to play it, they'd love to hear more. Uh, so Little Orpheus is a, an Apple Arcade um, platform adventure game about a hapless Soviet cosmonaut who accidentally goes to the center of the Earth and saves the world without meaning to. And we're really <laughs> very, very, very happy that it's been uh, selected for uh, shortlisting. Next up, we have from Song of Bloom, we have Philip Stalinmeyer. How are you doing, Philip? Thank you. Thanks, I'm fine. Good, good. Give the folks at home a little bit of info about the game as well. Um, the game, Song of Bloom, yeah, it's pretty hard to describe what the game is. Um, it's more like a, a short narrative experience, I would call it, not necessarily a game, but something that you can interact with, and when it stops, it stops. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And last but not least, uh, from south of the circle, we have Luke Whitaker and Catherine Bidwell. How are you both doing today? Hi, nice Hi. to meet you. Thanks for having us. I'm so excited to have you on as well. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the work that you all have been working on. Yeah, well, I'm Catherine Bidwell, and I'm founder and director of development at State of Play in South of the Circle. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm founder and creative director as well. Um, and South of the Circle uh, is a narrative adventure game. It's set in Antarctica in the 1960s during the Cold War. Uh, and you play Peter, who's an academic from Cambridge, and you've crash landed there and it looks like your mission is to get out of there, but it, it quickly goes into his memories. Ooh, I love that, I love that. Again, thank you all for being here. Excited to talk about your games and talk about you and all the work, awesome stuff that you have been doing and up to. Um, the first thing I wanna kind of dig into is, is more kind of a general question for all of you. Um, you know, where has the craft of creating games on the mobile platform gone over the past 10 years? And where would you like to see it kind of move in the next five or so? Uh, let's start off with Jeff. Jeff, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a great question. Honestly, um, you know, if we look back 10, 15 years ago, we probably could never really predicted, you know, how far uh, gaming on this platform would, would come. Um, and I think over time, you're really getting to see people be more and more creative in, in the ways that they can kind of flex their muscle on this platform. I mean, even in this panel, we have a really crazy diversity of, of different games from, you know, narrative adventures, some games that that's, you know, are more, more of a, an adventure, less of a game, uh, some core games like like the one we made. Um, and so I think over time, what you're going to see is people are just going to master this platform. And it's one where, you know, I don't see it going, you know, go, going away anytime soon. And so um, all the skill and the creativity on this platform is only going to evolve over over time and, and the breadth that which people can uh, build things is going to expand. So um, I think it's actually one of the most exciting platforms and it's the one where you can have the biggest impact on players because, you know, everyone uh, is probably going to have a phone um, if they don't already have one over the next, you know, 50 years. So, um, yeah, I think it's quickly, it's probably of all the platforms you could be on uh, evolved the most, especially for games. So it's an exciting time. Yeah, things things are moving at a, such a rapid pace in terms of the way tech has kind of moved, you know, in the past 10 years. You know, I remember very much so having a, a Nokia really small phone, <laughs> <laughs> having something that I was playing Snake on as opposed to right. some of the beautiful stuff we see you all playing now. Um, Luke and Catherine, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about kind of the evolution of, of the mobile platform over the past kind of 10 years or so. Yeah. Well, as, as the technology, you know, evolves year on year, you know, we as developers, we've got to 
keep up with it. And what I love is that, you know, this game was made and it just happens to be on a mobile. It could have been, you know, on a on a, um, a larger scale, but the immediacy of mobile phones means, like, like you said, everyone can have it and have that experience. And the technology means, you know, it looks beautiful on something that's in your in your hand, which but I is think, what we love. I think and for State of Play, it's been a really important um, way of or important audiences opened up for us basically yeah. because um yeah it's it's just such a wide audience of what such a wide number of people have phones we wanted to make the kind of games that everyone could appreciate and I think a lot of people probably on this panel uh feel the same way um and yeah it's it's meant that we can be creative we can explore new avenues and um it's really interesting to see how it's evolved I mean I, I think it's interesting for example with stuff like Horror Vista, that it's like phones have kind of become something you can reference in a game as well, and they're like they're they're informing yeah. the game itself. It is the game. Yeah, one of the one of the coolest parts of of, of Hollow Vista is is you know there is a uh, an identification with certain parts of the ecosystem and the part of the culture too. You know, we, there are parts of that reference. You know, things like Instagram in a in a real way. Uh, which I which I love and, and, and want to dig into that star. What are your thoughts about that? Because you know you're doing something very special in that space where you're you're kind of being referential in the way that you're kind of using the game mechanics and the way that it works to talk about not only you know the story that you're building but the culture that we currently live in as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we're doing kind of a meta commentary on <laughs> uh, the state of mobile and um, not just within games, but all the ways that we interact with our phone. And, you know, I think as far as where games are going, uh, I think mobile kind of is echoing a larger shift in games in general, which is just to say that like, there's way more of them than there used to be. And way more people are able to engage with the medium now than ever before. And that means that we're able to tell different kinds of stories than we were five or 10 years ago. I'm really excited to know what everyone else's story is the stories we haven't heard yet from the kinds of people who haven't previously been a part of the games community yeah it's 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 it opens up so many avenues for different kinds of experiences and different kinds of ways to play and different ways to you know enjoy something on a, on a medium and a, and, a, and a piece of hardware that you know before was just for communication it wasn't for all these other wonderful things we were able to kind of do with that uh, Philip, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about this as well, because your, your game is fantastic in that way, especially. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I always try to to uh, think the, the the context of the game and how it's uh, it's been played um, for for developing the games. Um, and I think what has been said is is really true about about mobile. And also, uh, I think ten years is a good span to to look at mobile gaming uh, because pretty exact 10 years ago tiny wings was released which really um opened up this whole okay we have to rethink stuff for mobile and not only scale big things down um and what everyone here in this panel is really good at uh, is um saying goodbye to the idea of huge uh, cinematography and instead focusing on what mobile is and how we use our phones and what we can do instead. Yeah, it, it's it kind of comes through in, in in each one of your games, and especially I think, you know, with Little Orpheus, uh, I think that there's a, a part of that Dan where you know when I initially was kind of re going through the the games that we were going to share today, uh, you know, just on initial glance, I was like, oh, this like this game reminds me of so many games that I've played on, uh, you know, larger hardware in that respect of like, just from an initial glance at it, you know, what's the conversation been, you know, between you and the, and, and, and the other folks who you've been working with to kind of make this happen about the technology gap and technology leap that we've had uh, in, in the past couple of years in terms of mobile? So, I mean, it, interestingly, it was our first mobile title. We've got lots, uh. sort of, lots of people that have worked on mobile before, but the as a studio, we've always worked on console and we've always had quite sort of ambitious audio visual targets that we've, you know, we, we cooked a first generation PS4 when we made Rapture in 2015, which was mm -hmm. an interesting moment. And for Orpheus, we really wanted, I guess it was kind of going back to 
for me, the kind of Republic serials of the 1930s when, you know, you had these tiny little black and white screens and they were like producing these whole worlds like Rocket Man, Warlords of Atlantis, sorry, um, uh, Undersea Kingdom, which then led to Warlords of Atlantis and stuff like that. And with Orpheus, we really wanted the idea almost, there was a bit thing here of, of how much world can we cram into this little thing? And the idea of taking that sort of Saturday morning special of being really sort of like bold with it, I guess, um, of having a game which is fundamentally sort of about storytelling, but is this idea of going, what, what are the worlds we can put in here? If we can have a character who's this kind of Walter Mitty fantasist, anything which he can think of, we have to try and get on screen somehow. And it was great doing that with mobile because I think for a lot of us, it was sort of coming to it and going, we can't believe how much we can get into a device now, how amazing we can make this art and the music and everything else. And sort of coming to mobile from sort of console PC, it was incredibly liberating to kind of, to go, we can do a lot before the fame catches fire. This is, this is fun, you know? <laughs> before, before it actually explodes in my hands while I play it, there's so many things we can actually get done. Um, I'm curious as well. Go in with a question on that. Yeah, please, please. Because Absolutely. I'm interested, it, it was one where, like, with Little Orpheus has this amazing combination of huge, big cinematic vision, and yet you've very cleverly divided it up into little sections that you can play, 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there. I imagine you came up with this idea before the pandemic when thinking people on a commute might want 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there. Yeah. But it's still perfect for the device, because I don't really want that much longer on a device anyway. But I'm interested in how that affected your writing process and how like um how how difficult was it cramming these big visions into these little small sections when i don't know how everyone else is i mean like i say i mean you're probably all more experienced in terms of mobile development than me but like as a mobile player my experience playing mobile isn't that different to playing console because like i've got you know I don't get that much time on a console. I'm lucky if I can get in, get half an hour and then get out back out again. And that's kind of like, I think if you're slightly older or you're a parent, that's just the reality of how you play games anyway. So there's a weird kind of thing where I think it goes through. Um, I suppose sort of like one of the things that I'm really interested in, in people that are really sort of so experienced with, 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 with mobile titles, I'm slightly in awe of is how you kind of get to the point where you can go, I can give you a totally rewarded, rewarding, completely rounded, gaming experience that you can be in of and out of again in literally three, five, six minutes, and you still feel that sense of completion. You still feel like you've achieved something in there. And for me, that's one of the real art forms of mobile development that I, I yeah, like I say, kind of coming from slightly from the outside, I mean, such kind of bore of people that can get that sense of, I've really achieved something here and I've done it in literally minutes and I'm out again. And that's, I think that's a really remarkable thing that, that you know, happens. Yeah, it's it's um, it is interesting to hear you say that because I think one of the, the the parts of that conversation is you know trying to figure out that gap between what you have an expectation for what your players are going to love and then they come back with more feedback about other things that you didn't have an expectation for in that respect. You know, what were some of the things you kind of um, you know hope that folks would love, but then you know you got some some different surprises during launch, or you got some very special feedback that, that that kind of reinforced some of those or you know kind of made you decide that you know in you know updates or anything like that you'd want to maybe tweak some things and change in a little bit of direction i'll i'll, I'll start that with you dan and then we'll we'll continue because i kind of want to loop that around the room too because i think that's a really interesting question as well and um, i mean i think like any game that you put out the door you sort of put it out the door and, and no matter how proud you are of it how much you've worked in it you always sort of hold your breath a little bit and go and hide under the table until people start <laughs> playing it and telling you what they think so i don't know i mean i'm a writer so for me it's it's it always boils down to you want people to be told a good story and to tell good stories themselves and, and come away feeling like they've, they've got something out of it and if people are coming away from it you know with that experience then you've done your job and but it's a lot of stress around whether or not you've done your job properly i think <laughs> people really really responded to the characters which is the most important thing for me again as a writer is i, I love the general i love even i think that they're, they're really sometimes you kind of just have people that just pop into your head and writing them is like no chore at all they just write themselves the moment you kind of hear their voices but mm -hmm. you kind of want other people to get to know them and fall in love with them as well so that's always you know the thing which you're kind of for me is is the most far i'm curious about that from here and too Oh, I'm sorry, Dan, I, I cut you off. What was that no, last thing you shared? I was just rambling. Sorry, interrupt. <laughs> There's no rambling here. It's all it's all good conversation. Uh, Star, I'm curious about that for you, too. I, I know, you know, a game that oozes such style like yours, you know, you have a, a lot of core tenets and philosophies kind of going into 
a project like that? You know, what were some some surprises that you kind of found once it was out in the world about how kind of people took to it? Um, well, I'd say the biggest surprise um, probably was during play testing, which is that hmm. like Hollow Vista initially was not a hidden object game at all. And uh, it was more about like uh, the story going different directions, depending on what you chose to take pictures of and what you chose to share. Um, because we were interested in exploring this space of like, what parts of yourself are you willing to put out there online? Um, but it turned out that our testers didn't understand the impact that each picture took. And it wasn't until we actually instructed them like, photograph this thing, um, that they really started being creative about how they chose to photograph those things and, you oh. know, framing up the right shot and kind of leaning into the aesthetic sensibility of what it is to document yourself. Huh, that's interesting because that, that, that would fundamentally change so much of that game when people were like, when you gave them those instructions to kind of like focus in on this um, in that way, that's actually really, really brilliant. Um, I, yeah, you know, I'm trying to think of like what that means for a game like Sound Song of Bloom as well, right? Where, you know, you're, you're trying to focus in and, and focus the player in a very kind of specific way without giving them too much so that they automatically kind of learn what the puzzle is. You want to, you want to give them that surprise and delight and let them kind of explore. I'm, I'm curious to hear uh, from you about, you know, with a constantly kind of shifting unique experience that you felt like you were kind of riding along, the players riding along with you, you know, what did you kind of expect players to kind of most dig into or, or, or feel like, you know, that so much was going to be happening underneath the surface? How did you kind of make sure that they were kind of capturing and, and, and getting into all the good meat of, of the game without, you know, getting stuck or, or getting, you know, too lost in, in the space? I'm curious about that from you. Yeah, that was, uh, that was really a tough question. Um, and I think it was probably about the same process as uh, Star said with uh, Hollow Vista that I um, really wanted that the player is uh, motivated to explore it and, and feel playful to, to just play with it. Um, but instead, they just waited for instructions, uh, which I just didn't want to provide. So, so I just open up a space and that space lets you do anything so you can uh, you can interact with it via touch and something happens not necessarily the right thing but something happens um, or you can uh, you can use the gyrometer to turn your phone and um, so my question to that was to um, answer any interaction with something that happens on screen but um, you have to find out what is the one thing that leads to the end? So oh. playful, uh, give give them a reason to playfully explore what happens. Yeah, I I, I love that. I think um, you know, getting a chance to to kind of play around in the world a little bit. It you, you've nailed that part. I think that that is something that definitely comes through in that way very specifically. I'm I'm curious, Jeff, in a, in a game like Rintera, you know, they are they are kind of fairly not strict rules but you have a, a a set of things that you need to kind of tackle right um and you're and you're leading the player to kind of best you know make their best decks to kind of make this make that space you know as competitive for them to be able to kind of compete ac across other folks in that way you know what's that conversation like for you all as well to kind of you know give them space to explore while also kind of funneling them through uh, an experience where they can be competitive and still, you know, build decks in a way that they feel like they can. What's the what's the balance there that you had that you had to find there? Yeah, that's a really good question, especially in the context of coming from, um, you know, the other awesome games in the room. I think you know we're in a we're in a different area in terms of that we do have that somewhat competitive slant as you talked about that kind of one versus one nature. But the yeah. funny thing is actually we kind of came at it somewhat similarly to how others in the room have been talking about it, where. We actually wanted to make sure that players' creativity and, and their cleverness and figuring out how cards fit together and how they can make them part of their own strategy and what what's that little nugget of, of a card that no one else is using that is actually really valuable or, or cool to you that you can fit in that no one else is using. And so um, you know, even in a kind of competitive setting, it was really important for us to build a game that, uh, that had a uh, that kind of turned the genre on its head in terms of the the collection model we're, we're 
most of the time in this genre, you're, you're strapped for resources. You're trying to figure out how can I collect this? We're actually trying to give you as many tools as possible and then not giving you the direction to say, go make this thing. We want to give you the optionality to kind of figure out what's a cool combination of things that will work for you. And, and I think that's where the magic of the kind of deck builder or the CCG comes from is when you can look at all these cool discrete pieces, you know, be inspired by something you see and just start building something. Um, and if it's successful, you feel that, that kind of deep uh, pride around building something that was, that was unique to you. And so um, that was always really core to our, uh, our kind of game design, uh, our philosophy. And uh, it, it's interesting to, to kind of hear those other answers because while the games end up looking very different, providing kind of that creativity is, uh, seems like it's a core part of a, of a lot of the games in the room. I was also really interested to, to, to hear you talk a little bit about, you know, having, having these, this other super large IP that you're kind of, you know, playing around in, in, in Runterra uh, and having League kind of be there as the, the, the foundational and backbone of some of that stuff, you know, how, how difficult was it to kind of like expand that in a way that let the fans feel like they could still be a part of this newer thing without feeling tied to the older thing? in that way, or, or maybe that's the thing that you wanted. You wanted them to still have that cohesion between those, those, those two different parts of the, of the eco, of the ecosystem that you have built. Yeah, it's a big question. I mean, obviously we've spent, you know, probably thousands of hours on this topic where, you know, we expected two different kind of uh, demographics of players that are coming from opposite ends. One, you know, League of Legends players that may have spent thousands of hours playing these champions um, and then players that are new to the League IP that are interested in a really fun and, you know, generous strategy game. Um, but where we started from was, you know, League of Legends is historically about these champions, which are kind of like these larger than life, archetypical, inspirational characters. Um, but with Legends of Runeterra, uh, it really just gave us the opportunity to actually build out the rest of this very diverse and unique world where these champions come from. Um, and yeah, if you can imagine it, uh, in, in Legend, League of Legends, there's probably about 130 champions, but we're, we're putting out, you know, hundreds of cards per set, you know, it's going to be thousands mm. of cards soon. So it was really important for us to start at the beginning and in the pre-production process, really build out and flesh out the world and, you know, place these champions in the world of Runeterra. Where do they live? Who are their friends? Who are their followers? Who are their enemies? And so there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of pre-production work and um, concepts and narrative and a bunch of stuff just to flesh out this actual world. Um, so yeah, you do meet the champions and we celebrate them and they have these amazing epic like level up moments, but it's also, you know, the friends and the followers and the creatures and everything like that. Um, and honestly, building, being able to build out that world and show, uh, you know, the world of League of Legends as something that players could get excited about, not just the champions and make it feel like a, you know, real breathing uh, place. And every time we release a new set, expand to a new region and get people excited about that. That's honestly, to me, one of the most fun parts of making this game, being able to kind of really add that breath and color and diversity to a world that, uh, that players have, some players have spent thousands of hours in already and didn't really know it. And then uh, for all the new players <laughs> getting to introduce those characters uh, you know, at the same time as everyone else is, is getting to learn about them. So that's been really fun. It's been very, very challenging, but I think it's one of the, the things that the team has been excited about the most and that we've been, yeah, it's, mo it's really it's so fun to watch players, you know, unveil and, and, and learn about that for the first time. Thank you for sharing that. I, I know that's a difficult thing to, to, to kind of, you know, to, to make that connection and, and, and do that. But I'm curious as well from, from Luke and Catherine, you know, you are built this wonderful world around this fantastic narrative. Um, and, and, and you've used these fantastic, like super awesome cinematic techniques to, to kind of push that narrative forward. Um, you know, what was your process to kind of achieve that artistic re realism uh, with such robust characters that you've made? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, well, <laughs> the important thing with, like with get, creating the, the depth to the story was actually starting with started with a novel so it began huh. as an idea the inspiration actually came from a novel uh, called the incredible it's the amazing adventures of cavalier and clay which is by michael chabon and um it it has this incredible scene in it it's about um a it's about jewish brothers who have to escape from nazi germany um just before the first world war to the second world war sorry and um one of them gets posted to antarctica 
and he he basically has this moment where he comes across a, a German in the snow and he doesn't know what to do like he the question is like who are you when you're distanced from all that so that was the spark of it uh, and I ended up going writing a story based on on that and that helped get the depth of character to begin with but that w was something we could then build on by making sure that our script was uh, as good as it could possibly be and in terms of process of make, making that come alive we made sure that we got the best actors that we could work with we made sure that we did a lot of research with them we did a lot of rehearsals um, so they really became a part of it and I think it was really important to us that it felt natural and that was one thing that we really tried to get across with our actors straight away was that this isn't a, a stagey thing this is more yeah. like you know before sunrise before sunset we love those films we love that kind of um, naturalistic way of speaking. It was something we really wanted to push in video games as well. So yeah, we experimented with these different ways of performing it um, and yeah, really created that bond between us, the characters and, and, uh, and that's what you see, I think on screen. Yeah, and we really kind of, to get that naturalistic um, performance, I mean, for a start, we had a really amazing cast and um, Gwynnem Lee, Olivia um, Final, Anton Lesser and they they just brought the words to life you know it's something we'd never done before and it was really important to us but also when the actors were in the motion capture we did record the sound there and then and that's and that's what you you're seeing on your mobiles you know it, it we didn't want it, it we wanted it to feel more like a theatre production than a like okay now we're going to do this stunt scene now we're going to do this um, and I think um, with all that kind of coming together that's what you're seeing and that's what you're appreciating in the game, we hope. Yeah, it surprised us how few <laughs> games record sound and voice, you know, sound, action, face, all at the same time. Um, I think it'll be pretty standard soon, but especially in a mobile title, I don't think it's, it's yeah, seen very yeah. much. Um, but it's so key, you know, when when meaning in a narrative adventure can be just the pause but or, the, or a little look in the eye or something like that. I mean, it was absolutely essential for us. It is all those small touches that bring all of your games together in, in these kind of fantastic and beautiful ways. And, uh, you know, again, thank you all for, for sharing thoughts on, on, on everything that you've done in, in the games that you put out into the world because they're all fantastic. And now we get to tell you all who gets to win the award for best mobile game of the year. Uh, and our winner is Legends of Runeterra. Congratulations, <laughs> Jeff. Wow. That's amazing. Congrats, congrats, congrats. Gosh, I mean, that's amazing. It's it's definitely an honor to be recognized by by Dice and honestly to be up on uh, up here with such great company. So thank you all very much. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm floored because Honestly, our mission has always been to kind of create that card game that celebrated uh, players, you know, creativity and cleverness, like I talked about, and uh, and showcase these rich stories in the League of Legends universe. And um, you know, it's tough. I think we're entering a uh, we're entering a genre that has a lot of different stigmas about it. Um, but I'm I'm really excited how we've been able to bring that universe to our players and and also bring joy, to, hopefully, to a lot of players' lives, especially during this crazy time. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll say thanks to. To riot and all the writers who um, you know supported us along the way here, uh, you know I honestly feel like we couldn't have made this game uh, anywhere else, and I feel really uh, proud to be there and, and to uh, to represent them. And and honestly, congrats to our amazing team who worked on Legends of Runeterra and their dedication towards you know making our players' dreams come true. Where you know I think a lot of us grew up playing card games and uh, and we're just we were able to like kind of make our dream game and and do that in a really cool way and to uh, and I'm excited for what we're going to do together and and um, yeah I guess lastly we always we always want to really thank our players because that's that's the people that fuel our passions that inspire us to make these games uh, to bring that to them so all, all the stuff that we do is is really to make them happy and uh, you know hopefully there's kids out there growing up playing card games right now that uh, get, get inspired and you know go make their own games someday so um, you know, thanks so much, Dice, and uh, uh, I really, we really appreciate it. It's quite an honor. Well, thank you for for sharing those kind words uh, and congratulations. And again, Star Dan Philip 
Luke and Catherine, thank you so, so much for, for being with us today. I, you know, your games are beautiful. Uh, they have definitely shared uh, fantastic experiences across the world uh, and want to see more and more uh, cool stuff coming out of all of you uh, in the future. So thank you again for, for hanging out with us here at the Dice Awards. Uh, and thank you so much for, for being here.